If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. After the Board of Freeholders formed in September 2019, some supporters of the process were bullish that the 19-member panel could recommend significant changes to city and county government. There's just one big problem. The board hasn't been able to do anything, thanks to a prolonged deadlock to approve St. Louis's appointees. It's an outcome that's left city policymakers frustrated and vulnerable to costly consequences. So on the latest episode of Politically Speaking, St. Louis Public Radio's Julie O'Donohue and I talk about this freeholder's deadlock. We also check in with St. Louis Public Radio's State House reporter Jacqueline Driscoll to talk about State Auditor Nicole Galloway's audit of Josh Hawley. And we talk with the Kansas City Star's Jason Hancock about medical marijuana in Missouri. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that, that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. We want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. Welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, Julie O'Donohue, and I'm here in studio with my co-host. Jason Rosenbaum. And we are joined by our Jefferson City correspondent. Jacqueline Driscoll. Uh, And we're talking about a variety of topics today. We're going to talk about the audit that Nicole Galloway did of Josh Hawley while he was attorney general. We're also going to talk about what, if anything, is going on with the Board of Freeholders. And we are going to be joined by Kansas City Star reporter Jason Hancock to talk about a dispute over medical marijuana licenses. But first, let's talk about this audit. We're recording this on Thursday afternoon. This audit was released earlier today, uh, and it is a audit that is critical of Josh Hawley's time when he was attorney general. Jason, do you want to explain what happened today? We talked a little bit about this, or at least alluded to this on last week's show, uh, but that was before the audit actually came out. And Galloway's audit revealed a Several things we already knew, like the revelation that some of Holly's consultants interacted with attorney general staff has been known since 2018. And some of the instances that were mentioned in the audit have been mentioned in prior news reports. There was also a, a, a finding involving the use of the state car and whether it was used for personal or political travel, and also about using personal email calendars and texts to conduct state business. One of the key quotes from the audit, after explaining two instances where the consultants talked with Attorney General staff, was, these two interactions between Holly administration officials and campaign paid consultants give the appearance of political activity by state employees while using state resources, but no evidence exists that any laws were violated. So, Jacqueline, you were at the press conference with Auditor Galloway. Are there things about the audit that she was particularly interested in highlighting? Not really. Um, the The audit is hundreds of pages long, so it obviously was a longer press conference. She spoke spe- specifically just pretty much about what Jason just mentioned, about how the state vehicle could have been used improperly, the campaign consultants that were coordinating with the attorney general office staff, and personal text and email being used for state businesses. There wasn't, she didn't steer clear of her script there. Um, she was careful to mention, though, that they didn't find that any laws were violated. Violated. Um, so she's releasing this audit. There are no laws that are violated. So she's not sure what the next steps would be. Um, she did mention that she had a lot of pushback when conducting this audit. She says it's the most pushback she's ever received. Um, so that it, that was alluding to why it took so long, because some people were questioning the integrity of her office, saying that she was simply searching for something wrong um, because it was now U.S. Senator Josh Hawley. Um, um, so she wanted to find something that was, you know, not favorable to him. 
Now, to both of you, has the senator's office addressed the substance of the audit? I know he has been saying his office has been saying for weeks that he thought there might be bias in the audit. I know we've heard from Senator Schatz and others that they were concerned about how long the audit took to come out. Have they explained why people who went on to work on Josh Hawley's campaign were communicating with people in the attorney general's office? I think the response consistently, including when Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft was investigating this, is because there was no clear communication between the consultants and the AGO staffers that said, for example, I need you to do this thing for Josh Hawley's campaign, or I want you to do this so it benefits his Senate campaign. It fit within the confines of state law that allows political money to be used for ordinary expenses of the office. And frankly, from reading the two examples that are provided in the audit, even though I think that they raise like reasonable questions about whether these consultants were trying to like make Josh Hawley look better, I, I didn't really see that bright line stepped over like I just mentioned. So as you all both mentioned, no laws were broken. And I think Jason just went into some detail about how he didn't really see a line per- being crossed particularly. But it's clear that Josh Hawley's office has been very concerned about this audit for several days, if not weeks, um, because they have been kind of stirring the pot and, and making some allegations about it being biased and some other things. Why do we think that the senator's office was so concerned about this audit? I spoke with Senator Hawley a couple weeks ago. He feels that some aspects of how the audit was conducted was unfair. Um, he took issue with the fact that the, one of the audit managers, Bobby Showers, had made disparaging mar- remarks against President Trump and had donated a small amount of money to Claire McCaskill's campaign. He was eventually replaced by somebody else. And I also know that there's been a lot of consternation about an email that was inadvertently sent by by someone named Pam Allison about beefing up a part of, of the audit. And that was in reference to the email saying, let's drop a, a section about confidentiality and beefing up a section about personal emails and, and other things. Uh, Jacqueline, I understand that Pam Allison was actually at the press conference and actually responded to that. What did she have to say? Right. She was there and um, she basically said that she explained her time growing up on a cattle farm. And that's just a term that she used. She didn't mean any harm in saying that. She didn't intend to um, portray that she had any bias, that they needed to beef up anything in particular to find uh, Senator Hawley guilty of anything. She just simply said that is a phrase that's in my my everyday language. So I didn't mean any harm by it. I, I think that uh, a lot of this is, is hypercharged by the fact that Galloway is running for governor right now, and pretty much anything that she's doing that could be critical of either Governor Mike Parson's administration or other Republicans is immediately going to get fierce pushback from other Republicans. I, I think that would be the case, too, if, like, let's say there was a Republican auditor and a Democratic governor. I'm sure a similar dynamic was going on. It was certainly a similar dynamic when Claire McCaskill was running for the U.S. Senate. A, a lot more critic. There was a lot more critical eye on what she was doing. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks for coming on the podcast and talking to us about this audit and why it was such a big deal this week. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And moving on to our next segment, Jason's going to tell us or bring us up to speed on what's happening or maybe not happening with the Board of Freeholders. What's not happening is probably the most accurate summation. (laughs) Uh, We haven't heard about the Board of Freeholders in a while. So, Jason, why don't you tell us why we're not hearing about the Board of Freeholders? Well, I've done about 175 features for St. Louis Public Radio since 2013. And rarely have I done one on there's nothing happening on this thing. (laughs) But that's pretty much what I did this week because it is now February the city appointees were supposed to be approved months ago, and it still has not happened. There's a lot of factors behind this. For one thing, the chairman of the committee that has the city appoint, or the chairman of the committee that has the city nominees, Sam Moore, has been going through some health issues, and 
he wants to still be involved in the conclusion, and I think that they're trying to bring him in at the right time. I think there's the real reason for this deadlock is that Alderman did not like Mayor Cruson's nominees for various reasons. And members of the Black Caucus in particular have been especially vocal that there should be representatives from not only north of Del Mar, but north of Page in North St. Louis. One of the more interesting things is that for a while, right, the the county members and the governor's appointee could have been meeting by themselves, but that's no more. Right, because Mar- Montevani leaving means they don't have a quorum. Um, and we should explain he stepped down because he's thinking of running for county executive. That, that's correct. I actually want to play a clip now from Alderwoman Sharon Tyus, a first ward Democrat, and, he's, and she's a member of the committee that is looking into these freeholder nominees. This is kind of her perspective on how she feels that this entire focus on making the freeholders whole may not really amount to much. Neither the city or the county put this together, the municipal league did. I don't think they did an, enough checking because I don't think the city and the county really want to merge. They've, we've been, so I don't think you're going to get much out of it anyway. And what she's alluding to is the fact that every effort to somehow merge or combine St. Louis and St. Louis County over the past few decades have just failed miserably. So there is some truth to what she has to say about the poor track record of the Board of Freeholders. For those people on the Board of Aldermen, and I put Alderwoman Tyus in this category, who really never wanted to see this process get off the ground in the first place, have they kind of gotten what they wanted? Because now, even if the Board of Freeholders wanted to meet with Montevani gone, they they can't. I think it's unclear whether they're getting what they want because it's not clear whether this delay eats into the year-long clock that's within the Missouri Constitution. I think some members of the Board of Freeholders believe that the clock doesn't start until the city appointees are actually seated. Oh, right. So they have a year to do something. Yes. And I think that they're going to have to find some attorneys that are going to have to figure that out because that's real uncharted territory. I do think, though, that there is the perspective that being judicious on who the city appointees are makes some sense. This is Board of Aldermen President Lewis Reed explaining why it makes sense for the Board of Aldermen to do its due diligence. But also I understand why there's heightened awareness on both sides because there's so much uh, that this body it will be charged to do. I mean, we're talking about reshaping our government as, as you know, for the foreseeable future. That's going to be a, a hundred year change plus that we're looking at. Uh, so certainly it has to be done. It has to be done correctly. And one of the things that Reed has continuously said, and I think that there's some accuracy to this, is that one of the reasons why the statewide Better Together plan that would have created a metro government over the city and county failed was the near unanimous opposition to it from African-American political leaders. So in his view, making sure you're choosing the right people, especially from traditionally marginalized groups like the black community, to be at this table is so important. All right, so where we are now is not that different from where they, they were about, you know, I guess a couple months ago. So the city still doesn't have any appointees. The governor's appointee is... Uh, on the board, and then the county is down one appointee. Is Have you talked to anyone? Is there any movement to appoint someone to that empty seat? Yes, I did actually communicate with St. Louis County Executive Sam Page's communications people. They are in the process of looking at applications to replace Montevani. That person would have to go through the county council for approval, and I think that We'll have to see who he selects. There were a lot of people that wanted to be on the board of freeholders in both the county and the city. And I would say that there are probably are plenty of people still to choose from. It's just a question of, like, given the struggles to get the board of freeholders up and running, whether people are going to be that engaged as they were, say, four or five months ago. And I've got one more question. So if a new person ends up on this board... And so we have the full freight of county uh, members on the Board of Freeholders and the governor's appointee. Is there any chance that they are going to start meeting even if the city can't 
reach a compromise on who they want to appoint. I think there certainly is a chance that not only they would start meeting, but they could actually start hiring expensive staffers. Or this is the doomsday scenario that I've been talking about. And I'm not saying that this should happen. I've been talking about it because it could happen. And that is the Board of Freeholders could hire attorneys that could then sue the city of St. Louis for violating the Constitution. And if that occurred, the the city would have to pay for half the costs of the lawyers that are suing them because the Board of Freeholders has the power to hire staff and the county and city would have to pay for it. So I would say that someone like Reed has been trying to convey that to people because it is a real possibility because the city is not exactly drowning in money right now, and I'm sure that they would rather not pay for those sorts of things. Okay, Jason, we will check back in with you if this process ever gets off the ground. I'm sure it will, but, you know, we can always talk about this in a couple months if of nothing happening again. Okay, listeners, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to trade Jason Rosenbaum for Jason Hancock of the Kansas City Star. Jason Hancock is joining us to talk about the fight over the awarding of medical marijuana licenses. Stay tuned. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. And now we're back with the Kansas City Stars reporter, Jason Hancock. Hi, Jason. Hi, how are you? Okay, well, Jason's going to talk to us about some of the controversy over how the medical marijuana licenses were given out. I think these are licenses for both dispensaries and to grow the product, right, Jason? Right. The, The state's been sort of incrementally handing out these licenses, first for manufacturing and then cultivation and then uh most recently for the dispensaries. And there's been a lot of questions raised about the process and the scoring that went into this process with people who were jilted and lost out on licenses, raising a lot of red flags, saying that the process was arbitrary and unfair. And by last count, we've hit triple digits in the number of appeals and complaints that have been filed in reaction to some of these licenses. It sounds like from reading your story from a few days ago, the process was sort of farmed out to a third party vendor, right? The the group that actually picked who got the licenses was not part of state government. Can you explain that? Absolutely. So typically when there's a request for proposals and, and you know, you have bids on a state contract, it would go through the normal state contracting process through the Office of Administration. In this instance, the Department of Health and Senior Services decided in order to avoid any sort of potential allegations or fear of uh, political involvement in these decisions, because these could be very lucrative con- or licenses, they were gonna bring in a third party independent scorer to, uh, up to, to, to go through the bids, score them, and that would ultimately determine who would get the licenses. Um, The first time they sought someone for this contract to be the independent scorer, no one actually put in a bid. So they had to go back and put the bid out again a second time. They finally got some people to submit offers, and one company was chosen. It's sort of an amalgamation of two entities, a marijuana consulting firm from Nevada and this place called Oaksterdam University, which is Uh, sort of a a, a not-for-profit, unaccredited uh, institution in California. Was there any scrutiny of the fact that these two entities were chosen at the time? Uh, It depends on your definition of scrutiny. There was a lot of grumbling. There were people who had some concerns because they didn't... If you look at the scores of the people who submitted to do this, submitted bids to be the score, um, they were all extremely low. And the company that won actually scored pretty low. So there's some people who raised some eyebrows about this company, but look, every, this is who bid. 
and um, this is a new industry, and so I don't know if Price Waterhouse Coopers is going to come walking through the door to do this job. So there was some grumbling at the time, and you know it's only been more recent when there's been complaints about the license and the scores that people started to question whether the department did their due diligence, whether the scorer was qualified, whether they had the manpower to actually um, to actually do the job. And you know now that the questions are being raised, like I said, by these these companies that were jilted in the process. Okay, so I think whenever these types of licenses are given out, there are, in any state, there are complaints because there are winners and losers. Like some people get uh, the license to do the business, the medical marijuana business, and some people don't. Can you explain what the nature of the complaints are? And and are they most, are they basically just coming from people who weren't awarded licenses? Right. So the first step in a in this process, if you didn't get a license, is to file an appeal. I think they're called complaints with the Administrative Hearing Commission. They're going to handle all these and make sure that the process was followed properly for your bid. Um, there are some that have filed lawsuits, and eventually we will probably get to that stage where people start suing. But you're right. This is a process that is littered with litigation in other states. The main allegation of, of issues in Missouri is the, are the actual scores themselves. You have people who literally copied and pasted answers over multiple applications. If they were trying to get three cultivation licenses or five dispensary licenses, they would use the same answers for each of the applications, but they got different scores uh, depending on the application itself. So one example that I think we used in one of our stories was someone uh, was given for the same answer a 10 on their uh, plan for diversity in the business, and then another application they were given a four. One is uh, it designates an extraordinary plan. That it, goes, it goes above and beyond, and four was one of the lower scores you could get. And same wording, same answer, same everything, um, but yet two wildly different scores. And for a lot of these licenses, they, whether you got them or not, it came down to just a few points. And, and that's what a, the majority of these appeals are about is, if not for the discrepancies, if you had started to apply the scores evenly, a lot of these people say they would have gotten licensed, they would have fallen into the category, the, 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 the number that the, the department set. Um, the, the other complaint that people have a lot is that there was a cap set on licenses. They didn't believe the department had the authority to do that. So there were 60 cultivation licenses. I believe there was several hundred applicants. I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but one of the major complaints is, you know, if I was 64th and I believe the department didn't have the legal authority to set a cap, why was I, um, why was I denied? I met all the qualifications. I should get a license. So, so we're sort of in uncharted territory in a lot of this. We don't know because the AHC, the Administrative Hearing Commission, has the authority to just grant licenses if they feel as though these businesses make the argument that they uh, that the process wasn't there. So the other thing that came up in your story is that um, there were allegations that businesses who use voracious consulting maybe were given preferential treatment. And the way I read the story was that maybe that consulting service has something to do with the company that was um, scoring the bids. Uh, and can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So abs- Voracious and Oaksterdam are a joint venture that created this, I think it's called Wise Health Solutions. Um, and that's who the independent score is. So Voracious is a partner um, in the company that does the scoring. So they are, the, I think it's the, the, the CEO of Voracious is the guy who is sort of the lead on this independent scoring process. Um, and the allegations which are showing up in, a, in quite a few of these appeal complaints with the Administrative Hearing Commission is that, you know, they were a consulting business in Nevada and they're alleging that they had clients, apparently, allegedly from Nevada, who once they moved into Missouri, got licenses, which they believe would represent a conflict of interest. It's worth noting there are no specifics in any of these complaints. Nobody says, and here's the list of clients. And when we spoke to somebody who uh, made this allegation in their complaint, they were quick to say, look, we don't have the evidence right now, and that's the problem, and that's why we included it, because we're going to look at it in discovery. Voracious obviously denies that there's any conflict of interest, but, um, but that is sort of going around in a lot of these complaints, this idea that 
when you when you hire a consultant from another state um, that they could have conflicts that they should have had to disclose. Um, the other piece is that Oaksterdam University, who is the other partner, is they did these boot camps in Missouri where for $250 you could come in and talk to experts and get advice on how to apply for a license. And there's and in some instances there's there was ways that you could purchase business plans at these at these boot camps. So that's also finding its way into some of these appeals where folks are saying that that in itself is also a conflict of interest, that if you are working with some of these licensees before the process starts and then you are now in charge of scoring, then that is a conflict that should have either been disclosed, A, or B, disqualified. So to an outsider, the fact that there were people who were advising companies applying for licenses and that that same company then was involved in in scoring the, you know, the applications for the licenses and directly involved in who got picked. I mean, how are they explaining that that is not a conflict of interest? Because it seems like that would be a pretty obvious conflict of interest. On the boot camps, the Oaksterdam University is insisting that the completely separate individuals were involved in the boot camps and were eventually involved in the score and that they took pains to ensure that there was no potential overlap. As far as the, the voracious side, you know, like I said, there has been no concrete allegation of like whom he worked with that would have gotten a license in Missouri. These are all sort of, you know, nebulous accusations or allegations that are included in these appeals. And so on that side, they've been vehement. There is no conflict of interest. So a lot of this, I think, is just going to end up being worked out as we play through the legal process. And, um, you know, whether or not it factors in will be up to these administrative hearing commissioners. And there's only three of them, four of them. I can't remember. how. It's it's a very low number. We're going to have to deal with these hundreds of, of appeals and complaints over the next, you know, few months. So, of course, people care about who gets these licenses because there's a lot of money involved, I presume. Do you have an idea of, like, what type of scale of money is involved? I don't as far as as the individual businesses. I mean, in other states, you've seen, you know, some of the publicly traded companies that is another issue that's coming up in our state. But, um, you know, they trade on the stock exchange are worth tens of millions of dollars. You know, this is this is turning into a lucrative business. You know, and the next step, obviously, and there's already people collecting signatures to put this on the ballot, is recreational marijuana, which is far more lucrative and has come with its own set of, of problems in other states with its rollout. But um, and I think a lot of people, they see medical marijuana as a potentially very lucrative business, but they also see it as if you get a license to be a medical marijuana dispensary, cultivator, or distributor, or, or any of the various pieces of this world, that will put you at the front of the pack when the state legalizes recreational marijuana, and that's where the real money is. And so part of this is, is likely jockeying. You don't want to be the one that didn't get the license, and then you miss out next time when we, when we move to the next step. Okay. Well, thanks, Jason. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm sure we'll hear from you again soon. That's Jason Hancock. He's the lead political reporter for the Kansas City Star. Please stay tuned with us for after this break. And we're back for our final segment, which we called Show Me Something. This week, Jason, I wanted to talk about the political reaction to the Kansas City Chiefs winning the Super Bowl, or more specifically, President Trump's reaction. Can you fill us in on what President Trump tweeted shortly after the Chiefs won the Super Bowl? Well, first of all, the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. I'm not sure if you heard that, dear (laughs) listeners, but they, they won a very convincing victory over the San Francisco 49ers. And right after this win, this historic win occurred, President Trump tweeted out the following. Congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs on a great game and a fantastic comeback under immense pressure. You represented the great state of Kansas and, in fact, the entire USA so very well. Our country is, all caps, proud of you. Yeah, this tweet didn't last very long now, did it, Jason? No, it did not, because uh, the Kansas City Chiefs are not based in the great state of Kansas. They are based in the 
greater state of Missouri. And in fact, as soon as I saw that tweet, I quote tweeted the words, oh, no. Yeah. So, I mean, normally things like Super Bowls and particularly sports bring people together. Certainly, I think you would find Democrats and Republicans alike in Missouri who are very excited about the Chiefs win. But even this, a Super Bowl title cannot escape politics because people had strong views about this tweet from the president. Uh, a lot of Democrats criticized it. I believe Auditor Nicole Galloway basically sent out a tweet trolling it. Claire McCaskill said shortly after Donald Trump made this mistake and said that the Chiefs were in Kansas, it's Missouri, you stone cold idiot on Twitter. And that's the bottom line. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, actually, you know, I, I, I'm i a little bit sympathetic to the president. Uh, I certainly knew that there was a Kansas City, Kansas, and a Kansas City, Missouri before moving to Missouri, but I honestly could not have told you until a few months ago which side of that line the Chiefs were based on. And so I, I, well, I don't think I would have sent a tweet like this because I I probably would have realized I didn't know which side of the line the football team was based on. Uh, I'm not sure I ever would have discovered where the Chiefs were based, that they were based in Missouri had I not moved here. First of all, the president did delete this tweet and then send the correct tweet that the Chiefs are in Missouri. So I want to just point that out because a lot of the president's defenders have been making the bizarro and frankly an incredibly false argument that the Chiefs are like Kansas's team because Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas are basically the same thing. Well, I, I certainly <laughs> understand that there are many people from the Kansas side that go to Chiefs games. The Kansas side of the Kansas City metro area is very prosperous. A lot of people live there. People from Kansas were probably pretty excited yes. about this win. But here, there are three things wrong with this, in my opinion. Number one, we just went through this entire fiasco where Mary Louise Kelly of NPR was, was harangued by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo about her questions about Ukraine. And they apparently brought in a blank map and told her to point and find Ukraine on a map. And then said that she didn't say it when it's clear, like, she knows where Ukraine is. So there, there's that. Number two, even though the, the, the state of Kansas does have a big Chiefs fan base, the stadium is in, is in Missouri. It's been paid for by the citizens of Jackson County, Missouri. And it is now the only football team in the state of Missouri. And number three, I think this is just part and parcel with Trump, like, making statements about geographical areas without a lot of thought about how factual they are. I know I've harped on this a lot, but I cannot get over how he once said to an interviewer that Ferguson was one of the most dangerous cities in the world, which by any conceivable standard is false. And the people <laughs> of Ferguson who can be very divided on where their city should go were almost universally offended by that statement. Yeah, I do think because we work for public radio, one of the first things that came to mind for me was also this incident with Mary Louise Kelly, where Secretary Pompeo, who, by the way, is from Kansas, uh, wanted her to point to a map. And I guess he was trying to call her out on not knowing where Ukraine was. And uh, she has said, and I, I think many of us believe that, in fact, she does know where Ukraine is. I mean, I know where Ukraine is, but I'm also <laughs> part Ukrainian. So, I mean, it would have been funny if she would have pointed to Crimea on a map and said that's Ukraine. Because yeah. that's a real touchy subject among the Russians. But continue. I I just think, you know, this is it, it was a little bit jarring in a moment where politics is often set aside, that is when a sports team wins a national title, that suddenly we had a lot of Missouri uh, elected officials and other people involved in politics kind of taking sides over this tweet. Um, it, it made the partisan divide crop up very soon after this win took place in a way that I don't think it would have. Well, I think that both Republicans and Democrats, as well as Green Party members, Libertarians, Natural Law Party members, Communists, Socialists, members of the Whig Party and members of the Know Nothing Party can agree. Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in the NFL. The Chiefs are a great football team, and it's really great to see 
someone like Andy Reid finally get his Super Bowl ring. And that brings us to the end of our podcast. We'd like to thank our executive editor, Shula Newman, our politics editor, Fred Ehrlich. And Jason, I'd like to thank you. How do people reach you on Twitter? Well, they can reach me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. I also have an Instagram account with my beautiful children at Jason Rosenbaum. B-bomb and D-bomb? Yes. It was B-bomb's <laughs> birthday this week. I want to wish a, a, a happy sixth birthday to Brandon Todd Rosenbaum. He is the one of the lights of my life. <laughs> um, and you can reach me on Twitter at J.S. O'Donohue. Until next time, so long. <laughs>